Okay, ladies and gentlemen, when we can start, um, my name's Craig Walker. I'm the lead volunteer for ES Glenroth. It's in the surrounding areas. Can I just start by saying it's, it's fantastic to see such a, a massive turnout here. Um, I hope uh, you get all your questions answered. We're, we're very much a case of uh, pitching this to undecided, so if you've got any questions, they will be answered. Um, we've got three guests. The format's very, very straightforward. We'll hear from each of our guests in terms of why they believe that uh, independent Scotland is the best uh, future for our country and for our people. That will be followed by a QA and a session, so get your questions ready. They will be uh, most welcome. Uh, that, that's by far we, the most important part of the evening, so um, get your questions ready and we'll do as much as we can to make sure every person's question is heard. I'm going to introduce our first guest just now, uh, Lorna Beck to my left, who is born and bred in Billingry. She's a member of the Scottish Socialist Party. Uh, she stood as a list candidate in the 2007 Scottish Parliamentary elections and uh, worked for Colin Fox during his time uh, in the Scottish Parliament. Tonight she's here to represent Women for Independence. Please welcome Lorna Beck. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank Yes Glenn Rutus for inviting me along here to speak tonight. I'm, not, I'm really glad that I'm first and not having to follow these two guys. But, um, I'm here tonight to speak on behalf of Women for Independence. I'm not a professional speaker. It's a long, long time since I did anything like this. And I don't have all the facts and figures for you because they don't really stick in my head. I only have what's in my heart. So I'm one of those so-called romantic voters. So I hope you'll forgive me um, for using my notes tonight. On the 18th of September this year, I will be voting yes. Being part of an independent Scotland has been a long time dream of mine. Ever since I was old enough to get a basic understanding of what politics is all about and the people that are involved in it. And that's never changed for me. Despite talking to many people from different social and political backgrounds and debating the pros and cons of independence, I still haven't changed my mind. It's still what I dream about. The No campaign, unfortunately, or fortunately, however you look at it, has come up with absolutely nothing that makes me feel that we would be better together. And I believe that the question of independence actually transcends politics. It's a bit more than that. Thank you. There are many aspects to the question of independence. For me, the three most important considerations are aged six, four, and one. They're my grandsons. What kind of a country do I want them to grow up in? A country that determines its own path, makes its own decisions, and is accountable to the people that it seeks to represent. A country where, when the boys are of age, they can vote and actually get the government that they're voting for. work, employment, that pays them a decent wage so they can pay their way and not have to depend on benefits. A country which will not stand for its taxpayers being ripped off by ruthless bankers who go unpunished by a government that to me seems to be scared of them. A country where you're rewarded for hard work and success, not cheating, lying, or being unaccountable. A country that values its young people. They're our greatest asset. Learns from them and gives them a fighting chance. And I don't just want to see our country. And it is our country. It doesn't belong to Westminster. It doesn't belong to Holyrood. And it certainly doesn't belong to the House of Lords. It's ours. It belongs to all of us. And I don't just want to see our country de determine in its own path. I want to see it gain a sense of itself and its worth, be worth because we seem to have lost that over the years. 
And I want to see change, and I think we all want to see change. I don't want my grandsons to be brought up thinking that it's okay to cut people's benefits, to pay the lowest pensions in Europe to our old people, to see a rise in private landlords rather than see social housing built for those that need it. I don't want them to be worried about the abomination of weapons of mass destruction sitting in the Clyde. I want them to have opportunities, education, employment, a decent standard of living. That's not much to ask for. But most of all, I want them to be a part of something new. A country shaped by its own people, governed by its own people. A country that we can be proud of. And I want to see women earning the same money as a man doing the same job. <laughs> I'll see you later. I want to see more women heading companies, leading, being given the same chance of promotion. In other words, the quality that we've been promised by a Westminster government, which is making changes, but very, very slowly. And I would dearly love to see those who are elected to Holyrood, be it now or in an independent Scotland, to work together for the good of the people of Scotland. Stop acting like children in a nursery. Treat each other with respect. Instead of playing party politics, point scoring over one another. Behave yourselves and listen to the people who elect you. Listen to what we as a nation want and work together to achieve it. A lot of us didn't ask for this referendum, but here it is. In a little over six months' time, we'll be going to the polls to take a yes or no answer to the question, do you think Scotland should be an independent country? I get really annoyed and exasperated at the amount of Scots who chant the mantra, I'm voting no, I can't stand Alex Salmond. They still do not or cannot grasp the difference between a referendum and an election. It's got nothing to do with Alex Salmond. The SNP have merely given us the chance to vote on the future of our own country. And yes, the SNP will govern us after a yes vote, but two years later, and by nature of a yes vote, we, sorry, picked up two pages instead of one, <laughs> we as a nation will vote for who will govern us. It will be up to us, not a government down in Westminster who can't see past the city of London and who thinks of us as a northern region. We are a nation and we should never forget that. As part of a Britain which is not so great anymore, can somebody explain to me why I still see poverty, still see people living on the street, Still see rundown cities, towns and villages. Still see mass unemployment, no matter what the government figures say. Are we the only country in the world that has got oil and have become poorer? How does that work? It's incredible. I understand the arguments. I see through the ridiculous scare stories. I can smell the fear emanating from Westminster and they should be scared because we're onto them. We've seen right through them. They think we're stupid, well, let's just see about that. And I can fully understand the fear that's behind no voters and don't knows. It's a fear of the unknown. Will we make it alone? Will we fail? Well, I tell you, I would far rather be scared in an independent Scotland that's facing its own challenges than have the status quo and be terrified of what this government's going to do next. <laughs> Let's get back to looking after our vulnerable. Let's help and support the hard-working people 
of this country because they are our backbone. They are the people who will build this country back up again. Let's walk towards having a fairer, better off society. Let's become a country that we determine ourselves, one we can and will be proud of. Let's vote yes for Scottish independence. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lorna. I know from speaking around just how nervous she was about doing that speech, and I think most of you will agree she did a fantastic job. <laughs> Our next guest is Alan Grogan to my right. Uh, Alan is the leader of Labour for Independence. Uh, he studied politics and international relations at Dundee University, uh, following which he spent three years working in Asia. He's been a Labour supporter all his life, uh, and a member for more than 10 years. Disappointed at the Labour Party's stance on independence and their swing further to the right in terms of mainstream politics, Alan took the decision to form Labour for Independence, uh, which is a political organisation that works within the Labour Party and the wider Labour movement. He was elected leader of the group uh, at their first AGM in March 2013, and Labour for Independence continues to grow and uh, entrap members from within the Labour movement and uh, beyond. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Alan Grogan. Uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you to the Chair. Um, I'd like to thank you all for coming tonight on a bitterly cold uh, evening. I'm sure the, the prospect of the bar didn't have anything to do with it whatsoever. Um, <clears throat> As Lorna touched on, there's a couple of myths uh, within this independence referendum and it's that a yes vote is a vote for the SNP or perhaps the other one that's even more ludicrous is that a yes vote is a vanity project for Alex Salmond. If any of this were true, if these myths were true, then no Labour voter, including myself, would be, and no one in their right mind, to be honest, would vote yes. But the truth is, if the no campaign can keep telling these untruths, then the people will believe them. That's what they think. Their whole campaign, campaign revolves around fear and deception. They want those within the Labour movement to believe these assertions. And if they do that, then they win, without ever having to provide an argument of why we are better in the union. Well, hopefully tonight, and I'm fairly confident that tonight, that we're not going to be dealing in half-truths and assertions and nonsense like that because the Yes campaign is based on facts. You see, this vote isn't about nationalism, certainly not for me. It's not about if you wear a CU Jimmy hat, eat shortbread or watch Braveheart. It's nothing to do with those things at all. It's not about identity. The referendum is about having the powers to shape our nation for the better. It's about giving a voice to everyone in Scotland, not just those who can afford it. This referendum is about making a choice. A choice between the status quo and having the kind of society that people in Scotland want. Having a parliament which meets the needs and aspirations of the people and having governments who act in the best interests of all the people who she serves. It's my conclusion that the Westminster apparatus does not see beyond its own front door. If it did so, it certainly wouldn't be giving itself an 11% pay rise while great swarms of the country are struggling to put food on their tables. I've been a, a Labour supporter my whole life, as Craig said. I've been a Labour member for most of my adult life. I grew up... Now, this is, this is an independence campaign. I'm only 30 years of age. I know it's difficult to tell. But I grew up as a Thatcher child. And I was told by my parents that it would all change once we had a Labour government in power. They, like so many people across Scotland, believe this to be true. And yet it can never be true, not within this current union. You see, in order for Labour to become elected in Westminster, they have to appeal to the power base of UK politics. That's Middle England and London. Studies have continually shown that these voters have vastly different priorities to the people of Scotland. They prioritise finance, law and order and immigration. In Scotland, we prioritise education, healthcare and care for the elderly. So we in the Labour Party and the Labour Movement now face a choice. Someone within the Labour Movement will argue that 
if we vote yes, we are abandoning our comrades in the north of England. It's a noble notion, but that's all it is. It's noble. It's like sticking together on the ship of the Titanic while there's a lifeboat 50 feet away. We can lead by example, proving to them and to the world that it's possible to have an economically sound, fair and equal society. A society in which newspapers and political parties don't rule on fear or bigotry, rather one of inclusion and plurality, where everyone has a voice and nobody is left behind. An independent Scotland could set about a massive constitutional change in the rest of the United Kingdom. By voting yes, we can ensure that not only will we, we be free of Westminster rule, but the rest of the UK will have more of a say in running their, their affairs in a federalised United Kingdom. Removed from the shackles of Westminster, we will see a restoration of a real Scottish Labour Party, one which meets the needs and aspirations of the people of Scotland. We can once again become the party of the people of Scotland. Now I'll keep harbouring back to this, it's about choice. This is the time to choose what kind of society we want to be a part of. Currently we have a society where the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. We have bankers claiming millions of pounds of bonuses for failing in their jobs, while those who work hard are struggling to keep their jobs and pay their bills. These bankers whose ineptitude was bailed out by the working men and women, these same people who are now being blamed for the economic crisis that we're in. I heard a, a, a sort of amusing story. There was a, a Daily Mail reader, a banker, and someone on benefits were sharing a 12 pack of biscuits. And the, uh, the banker took 11 of the biscuits and then whispered in the Daily Mail reader's ear, Watch out, he's trying to steal your biscuit. <laughs> And that's, that's the kind of society we are living in today. Confucius once said, to be wealthy and honoured in an unjust society is a disgrace. Well, that disgrace is still going on right now in this United Kingdom. We are the fourth most unequal society in the Western world. The Scotland we live in today, 25% of our children are growing up in poverty. This isn't just a statistic on a piece of paper. This is happening in this country right now. Parents are going without their food to feed their kids. Pensioners are having to choose between heating their homes or having a meal. I don't know if any of you saw in the papers this week that food banks are actually receiving donations back because people can't afford to heat the food that's happening. Parts of Glasgow have a lower life expectancy than the Gaza Strip. For the first time in over a century, parents are unable to provide a better future for their children than what they had themselves. We are funding and are set to renew to the tune of £25 billion an outdated nuclear arsenal that has no place in a modern civilised society. More nurses are needed. Our children need better schools with better resources. The Red Cross are shipping in food, pa food parcels to Scotland in peacetime. That is an absolute disgrace. <laughs> and all of this is happening. All of this is happening in a country that has a £10 billion food and drink industry, strong agriculture, fisheries and timber, ever-growing tourism and trade, research and development continuing to, to grow. Not to mention a potential £4 trillion in revenues in North Sea Oil. Future drilling possibilities in the west coast of Scotland once we get rid of Trident. And one quarter of Western Europe's renewable energy. Basically, Scotland is rich and we are still suffering. For too long we have waited in hope for more from the Westminster government. We're not better together. We can do better and we must do better. The choice to change this is in our hands. We can choose to stay as we are, or we can aspire for better. I want to see a Scottish Labour government elected in 2016, and I want to see them get rid of the unlawful bedroom tax, to start rebuilding social housing, giving people affordable homes. I want to see the energy of Scotland back in Scotland's hands. I want to see a real Labour Party in 2016 sticking up for the workers, removing the anti-trade union laws imposed by Westminster, I want to see people be incentivised to work. 
and given a proper salary, no matter what sector they work in. And I'm not just talking about a minimum wage or what Westminster would deem a living wage as they sit there in their ivory tower. A proper living wage, removing the need for people who work full time to ever have to use benefits. I want to see an end to PFIs, a renationalisation of the Royal Mail. I want a nation that cares for all of its citizens without getting labelled as a something for nothing society. I want to see a real Labour Party lead Scotland on the international stage, not as an imperialist bully, but as a proud nation that holds true to its international commitments and responsibilities. We can have a return to a real Scottish Labour Party, one that my granny used to tell me about, that looked after the worker who helped those who needed help who created the safety net of the welfare state in the NHS. That's the Labour I'm proud to be a member of, and that's the party that we can be again in an independent Scotland. <laughs> but it takes change. We need to put education before wars, healthcare before tax cuts for the rich, children before politicians. Within this union, this is impossible, but with independence, all things are possible. Now, that's not to say that independence will be a magic wand to cure all of Scotland's ills. There will be hard work, and there will be mistakes along the way. But independence guarantees that we, the people who live here, who care most about our society, determine how we go about in shaping it. For too long, the Labour and Social Movement in Scotland has blamed our woes on the ineptitude of governments in Westminster. On September 18th, we have the power to change that. Lorna mentioned uh, her grandchildren, and that's the main reason why she was voting yes. And it's a very admirable reason. I myself have two children. My wife is about to give birth to our third child in about a month's time. On September 18th, how can I look my four-month-old son in the eye and tell him that we gave that power away? That because of us, because we believed the lies about all being about Alex Salmon's vanity and about the SNP, that he and children that he will grow up with will have to live in a society that we have today, or worse. One of my party's founders, the great Keir Hardy, once said to the House of Commons, the last has not been heard of the socialist movement either in this country or in the floor of this house. I'm confident that if he was here today, he would be leading us in a yes vote. Because while on that floor in Westminster we will never again see the socialist movement, it can be heard in every city, every town, and every village across Scotland. We all have a choice to make. Don't let fear and lies cloud your judgment. We can be the difference in this vote. We can be the movement who leads Scotland to becoming an internationalist, strong, economically vibrant, socially just, equal nation. All we have to do is vote yes. You have the choice on September 18th. You have that power. Choose to keep it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alan. Um, I hope the rest of the audience, as I feel, uh, what Alan and his colleagues within the Labour for Independence Movement are doing is fantastically brave and I wish them every success as we go forward to September. <laughs> Final guest speaker of the evening is Blair Jenkins, uh, who is the Chief Executive of Yes Scotland. Now, Blair's been in journalism and broadcasting for over 30 years prior to his current position. Uh, previously held posts such as the Director of Broadcasting and STV, Head of News and Current Affairs in both STV and the BBC Scotland. He's chaired the Scottish Broadcasting Commission in 2007 and 8, and more recently the Scottish Digital Network. 2010, Blair was awarded an OBE in the Queen's Birthday Honours list for services to broadcasting. I'm absolutely delighted he's been able to find time in his busy schedule to join us this evening. Please welcome Blair Jenkins. Uh, thank you, Craig, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be uh, in Glenroth. It's, it's uh, terrific to see so many people here tonight. Um, both Lorna and Alan have spoken very eloquently and with great passion about why they are voting yes 
and about the kind of Scotland we can create with the right vote in September 18. So I won't spend much time talking about the, the arguments for independence because they've, they've expressed them very, very well. So what I'll mainly do is talk a bit about the campaign, how the Yes Scotland campaign is operating, the nature of our campaign and why it's so important that everybody gets involved and gives their time and helps us get that majority in September. So I'll talk a bit about the campaign, but before I do that, I mean, what I'd like to do, I think, at this stage, it's probably about time for a wee bit of audience participation, I think, well, probably at that point in the evening. So I'm going to ask a question that I've been asking in halls like this around Scotland for the last year and a half. Um, I know there'll be people here tonight who already decided that you're voting yes. There'll be people here who are still making up their minds. And there are probably one or two who at this stage are thinking they might vote no. So here's a question I'm going to ask you. I mean, from your own circle of family, friends, acquaintances, people you work with, do you know anyone who was intending to vote yes and is now intending to vote no? Does anyone know someone in that category? I've got a lot on the stage and I don't see any other hands. If I'm missing any, let me know. You'll see where I'm going with this. I'm now going to ask the other half of that question. From the same group, from the people you know, do you know anyone who was intending to vote no and is now intending to vote yes? Yep. Hey. Right, now that, um, I've got to tell you, um, arithmetic was never my strong point. Um, it's the only thing I've got in common with Alistair Darling. Um, <laughs> But that looked like about that looked like about two thirds of the hall to me, at least two thirds of the hall. I might be slightly understating it. I have to tell you, I've been asking that question all around Scotland, and as of my colleagues for the last year and a half and more, and we always get that response, that reaction. Um, and it, it, while it's you know it's anecdotal, if you like, but it's now very big anecdotal because we ask it everywhere. Now, this campaign, the Yes campaign, is wholly different from the No campaign, the Better Together campaign. For one thing, it is actually a real campaign. Uh, that's a, a very fundamental difference. To a large extent, our opponents uh, are three political parties and the politicians who make up those political parties. There is very little evidence anywhere around Scotland of a genuine grassroots ground campaign going on for Better Together. To a large extent, it is a bunch of politicians sitting around talking to one another, or at least the ones who are still talking to each other. <laughs> By contrast, Yes Scotland is a genuine national movement um, and it is on an unprecedented scale right around the country. I mean, I live in Glasgow now, but I come from, from Elgin up in Murray. And I, I launched uh, Yes Murray uh, towards the end of 2012. And I was back up speaking at the Birburn Supper just um, well, a few weeks ago. And from that launch of Yes Murray, there's now at least a dozen local Yes groups in that county, which is not, you know, not a heavily populated county. They've got referendum cafes, public meetings, there's canvassing and campaigning going on everywhere. There's just a whole lot of things going on. Um, people are getting involved who've never ever been involved in politics before. I mean, I've, I'm not in any political party, I've never been in any political campaign before. This is the one and only campaign I'm going to be involved in, so I'm very keen to get it right. Um, but lots and lots of people who are involved in this are not from a political background. Now, it's great that lots of people are from a political background. It is fantastic for the Yes campaign to have the strength of the Scottish National Party around Scotland. I mean, by now, by some distance, the best organised and most numerous uh, political party around Scotland. And it's great to have that as a bedrock of, of the local uh, campaign and the local organisation. But there are so many people from other political parties, Scottish Green Party, Scottish Socialist Party, Labour for Independence, a growing and very important part of the movement, but also that, that very large number of people who've never been involved before, but who just think, you know, now is the time for Scotland to decide to become an independent country. That is the right choice, it's the right future for our country. And it's an enormous um, privilege, frankly, to be part of this movement, part of this generation that recognises it's the right thing for Scotland to do. The way we win this referendum is by talking to people. On my first day in the job, um, people were saying to me, you know, what can I do right now, Blair? What's the most important thing I can do? You know, what can I do to help? And the, what I said that day, I still believe, is the most fundamentally true thing about the Yes campaign. And it is that if, if everybody who's intending to vote Yes, who's already intending to vote Yes, can convince just one other person that they know to also vote Yes, then we win. You know, if, if that's just a simple matter of statistical truth. Um, whatever any poll says and whatever you, you may read in the newspapers about uh, levels of support and opinion polls and things, it has always been true and remains true 
that if everyone who intends voting yes can persuade just one other person they know who's currently undecided, then we win. Uh, and I know we can do that. The way we win this campaign is community by community, meeting by meeting, household by household, conversation by conversation. People are most um, responsive to, they're most uh, influenced by people they know and people they like, people they respect in their own community, in their own neighbourhood. That will have far more influence on people than, uh, than any politician in the telly. We've got some very able politicians in the, in the Yes campaign, very eloquent speakers, people who are very, very good in the television studio, but by far the most influential people in this campaign are people in their own communities, influencing, persuading, talking to, listening to the people they know and getting them to understand the reasons for voting yes. All our evidence, all our experience from right around Scotland is that there are very, very few people who are completely unreceptive to the argument for independence. I have spoken to some of the most <coughs> unlikely people imaginable uh, and who've started off saying, no, no, it's not for me, you know, I can't, I can't afford it, or whatever, whatever the line is. If you can get people talking about it, listen to their concerns and explain to them why our better future is as an independent country, there are very, very few people who, who don't move uh, along the line towards yes. One of the smartest things we did as a campaign, and I can say this because it wasn't my idea, was uh, the first question we asked people is uh, to position themselves, the first thing we do is ask them to position themselves on a scale from one to 10, you know, on, in relation to their view to, to, on independence, where one is, you know, over my dead body, and 10 is, yes, I want to be independent yesterday. Uh, so position yourself somewhere between one and 10. And the thing is, once you get people thinking that way, um, they do start to see themselves moving up that scale. So it's not unusual for me now to have people will say to me, oh, you know, Blair, I was, I was a three or a four last year, I'm, I'm more like a five or a six or a seven now, or whatever. And it's a, it's a great way of getting people to visualize themselves as being on a journey, moving up that scale, moving towards 10. And everything I hear, everything I know from around Scotland tells me that if we have those conversations with people, and there's so much information out there now, I mean, there, you know, the Yes Scotland website, the, the various things that we've published, the argument for independence has never ever been as well articulated, never been as well stated as it is now. There are very compelling reasons, and, and my colleagues have talked about these. Um, but that democratic argument is so hugely important. People get it. The fact that uh, why should we put up with governments in London that we didn't vote for, imposing policies that we don't like. Uh, as I look in the, the, around the room at the age profile, I suspect a lot of people like me uh, remember the poll tax very well, which was imposed on us. We've had the, the modern day equivalent of that in the bedroom tax. But we see get the same recurring thing where conservative governments that we didn't vote for imposing policies on us that we don't want. Um, the first general election, the UK general election I voted in was 1979. It wasn't an awfully good election. It was the first one in which Margaret Thatcher got elected into Downing Street. By the time we get to the next UK general election next year, um, for two thirds of my voting lifetime, we'll have had Conservative governments uh, in, in Downing Street. We'll have had Conservative governments in charge of the major issues affecting the Scottish people. So this notion that, uh, you know, well, you don't need to vote yes because if you hang around long enough, eventually there'll be a Labour government which will pass something like we might want in the way of policies. Two thirds of the time since I started voting in general elections has been a Conservative-led government. Um, so this is, not, this is no answer to what Scotland needs is to cross our fingers and hope that Labour win a UK election in 2015. And as Alan made the point, uh, Labour governments uh, in recent decades have looked an awful lot like Conservative governments. So there really isn't an awful lot to choose between them. The democratic argument is a very strong one. Again, my colleagues have also uh, mentioned the strong argument around social justice, around a more equal Scotland. As somebody who's lived in Glasgow now for more than 30 years, and my kids were all born in Glasgow, and I'm very fond of the city, but coming from Elgin, uh, Glasgow was a bit of a shock, I have to say. Uh, the levels of deprivation in some parts of the city are still so obvious, so, so manifest, and so unacceptable. And for a country that it would be the top 10 in terms of the richest nations in the world, as an independent country, to tolerate the levels of inequality, of health and wealth and opportunity that we have in Scotland, there's just no reason why we should. It is completely unacceptable. One of the most horrifying statistics to do with our country is the fact that we do have the shortest life expectancy of any country in Western or Central Europe. Again, if we're the eighth wealthiest country in the world, why on earth should we have the worst mortality rates of any country in Western or Central Europe? It just doesn't make sense. The World Health Organization will tell you that the main driver of health inequality, of those kinds of differences in mortality rate, is uh, economic inequality. It's people not having the means 
the, the environment, the safety in their environment to lead decent lives and to, and to get the kind of life that everyone should be able to aspire to and to lead. A more, a, an independent Scotland, and Alan's talked about this, will be a prosperous Scotland. We know that. We know we've got a strong economy, a very diverse economy. I'm very keen on uh, creating new jobs and creating decent jobs for as many people as possible in Scotland. Two of my children are working away from Scotland uh, because they couldn't get the work they wanted here. Uh, they are coming back in time to vote. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it's something we all want. We want to create. I mean, Lorna made the point. It's about creating right, decent jobs for not just for the current generation, but for the generations to come. And I know we can do that much better as an independent country. So what we're doing tonight and what we're doing more and more as we go around Scotland and have lots of, of public meetings is this is more in the nature of a hope of a conversation. Um, we, we, you know, we don't do terribly long speeches anymore or anything. It is much more about getting engaged and talking to people and having a conversation with people. That's how we win. That's how we get people thinking that a yes vote is the right thing to do in September. Uh, Alan quoted uh, Confucius uh, a little earlier. So I'll, I'll, I'll finish uh, uh, with a quote from Abraham Lincoln that I've always liked, which is that uh, the, best way to predict your, the best way to predict your own future is to create your own future. I believe in September of this year, the people of Scotland will vote to put Scotland's future in Scotland's hands, and they will vote to create their own future. Thank you very much.